In this problem, we have a freely rotating turntable and we're given all the specs on that. And then I'm gonna drop a lump of clay onto it, which then just sticks to it. So this is very much like a collision problem. It's just a rotational collision. It's a perfectly inelastic collision where the two objects join up and rotate with a common velocity, common angular velocity at the end of the problem. And what's gonna happen here is angular momentum is conserved. So I'm going to write down a couple things to aid me in my calculations. First of all, let's get our moment of inertia formulas in for a disk. That's the turntable. That's 1 half mr squared. And then my blob of clay is going to land at a different radius. It's not landing on the edge of the disk. It's somewhere in between. So when I write down the moment of inertia for the point mass, I'm going to use a little different notation for the r, just so I don't get them confused. And for a point mass, it's just mr squared, and I'm going to call the mass little m, and the radius little r. All right, so because there's no net torque exerted on this system from the outside, I know that angular momentum is conserved, so L initial is equal to L final. And in the initial state, the clay blob doesn't carry any angular momentum at all. It has no rotation around that vertical axis. It's just falling straight down. So my initial state looks like this, I initial, omega initial. Final state, I final, omega final. And my initial moment of inertia is just going to be 1 half mr squared for that disk. And my final moment of inertia, I have now the disk plus a point mass stuck on it. So I have a 1 half mr squared for the disk plus a little m, little r squared for the blob of clay. And my goal here is to get the final angular velocity. So I'm just going to divide by its coefficient. I get omega final is going to be, let me just multiply both sides by 2 real quick. I don't want to have a complex fraction. So I distributed a 2 to every term. So it's going to be capital MR squared omega initial over mr squared plus 2 little m little r squared and I'm ready to plug in and notice here that it's perfectly fine to use non-standard units whatever units I put in um, for mass I could use grams for mass if I wanted or kilograms um, they're going to cancel in the numerator and denominator and the same is true for my units of length for the radii of these things and the mass of the disk is 550 grams and the radius is 15 centimeters, and I have to square that. Then I get 550 times 15 squared again in the denominator, plus 2 times the mass of the clay blob, that was 75, and then the radius that it sticks at in the final state is 10 centimeters, so 10 squared. All right, so the units of grams are going to cancel in the numerator and denominator, and the units of centimeters squared are going to cancel in the numerator and denominator. So all that stuff is gone, and I didn't need to worry about converting to SI units. Now, if I plug in my initial angular velocity in rotations per minute, so times 72 rotations per minute, that's the only surviving unit, so my final velocity will come out in rotations per minute. And I end up, after smashing the numbers, with 64.2 rotations per minute. And it's nice to have those units because it allows us to qualitatively compare with what we started with. So it's a, a slowdown of a considerable percentage, but not dramatic. To answer part B, I'm going to need SI units because I need joules to come out for energy. So I'm going to go ahead and do this on my final angular velocity right now. There's two pi radians in one rotation, and there's one minute for every 60 seconds. And the minutes cancel, and I'm left with radians per second. So when I smash these numbers in my calculator, I get 6.72 radians per second. So I'm going to need that for part B. Um, just as a side note here, so I don't run out of space, let's get our initial angular velocity converted as well. So rotations per minute, 72 rotations per minute times 2 pi radians per rotation times one minute for every 60 seconds. And when I do this one, I get 7.54 radians per second.
All right, let's find out how much kinetic energy was lost in this collision. So it shouldn't be any surprise when you look at an inelastic collision that you would have energy lost. It's just this collision is rotational instead of linear. So my initial rotational kinetic energy is going to be 1 half i omega squared. And in the initial state, my moment of inertia was just a 1 half mr squared for the disk. So 1 half times 0.55 kilograms times r squared. Again, I have to be careful to stay in SI units now. So there's 1 half m r squared in SI units. And then omega squared in the initial state. That's 7.54 all squared. And I end up with 0 0.176 joules of kinetic energy. The final kinetic energy is going to be 1 half i omega squared for the final state. But my i is not simple now. It has two different pieces. It has the 1 half times m times r squared for the disk plus the little m r squared for the point mass. So that's 0 0.075 kilograms for that point mass times the distance to the rotation axis. That's 0.1 meters squared. So there's my mr squared. Multiply all of that by 6.72 radians per second, all squared. And I get 0 0.157 joules. And so the energy lost would just be the difference there. And I get something like 0.02 joules of energy lost in the process.